thank you, Ivan, for the. Do we need to do we need to take a mic? Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to Moscow. I feel privileged, and uh, yeah. So I'm assigned to give you some of our ex insights in monitoring cerebral temperature and oxygenation in acute brain injury. Um, a few remarks. Uh, there may be some bias. Please decide on your own. And concerning the lecture, I decided to do it this way uh, to give you uh, some insight why we may want to have additional parameters in neurointensive care besides ICP or CPP. I give you some slides on nurse monitoring. This was also the topic this morning uh, in the ORR. It may be judged differently on the neuro ICU, and I will show you why. And I want to give you some information on new uh, research on brain uh, tissue oxygenation monitoring, I think which is the upcoming new thing on neurointensive care and uh, will is here to stay. And maybe some uh, outlook for brain temperature, which is not that much researched, but uh, maybe of interest for you too. Okay, let's start. Why do we need additional parameters besides ICP? This is one of the most beautiful papers uh, from the last years from Fabian Güser from Belgium. They investigated 360 patients from the Brain IT database and the, uh, they looked at patients, uh, whoops, sorry, this does not work, so. Oh yes, okay, they looked at patients being deceased, so uh, GOS level one, the patients die, patients who survive in a good condition, GOS level five, looked at uh, the average number of ICP raises and the duration of them, did some nice machine learning algorithm, which is uh, not completely understood, uh, but still it worked, and it translated into insult intensity and insult duration. And this was coded with a color being associated with good outcome in blue and worse outcome in red. And I already glimpsed at these images. It shows clearly uh, there's no border of ICP uh, which is to be tolerated uh, in adults. You can tolerate an ICP of 25 and have still a good outcome if it's well controlled within a short time. And if an ICP is 15 for a prolonged time, it may be associated with worse outcome. This is in adults. And the same is true for children, where even this line is translated more to the left side. The blue zone is much lighter. It may be interpreted as uh, if a child gets an ICP monitor, it has a rather <coughs> utmost severe condition. This is one thing, but also it may be interpreted as nature. There's no clear-cut border of 20, 25, or any number. And uh, if you look at this, this is how nature uh, behaves. If you have a newborn falling from the cradle, uh, well, this newborn has a normal blood pressure of, let's say, 70 or 80 or over 40. If this newborn develops an IVP, ICP of 20, it's likely to herniate. If, if you're a young man, uh, 120 over 80, normal blood pressure, ICP of 20, the same margin as suggested by the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, the ICP of 20 will be well tolerated. There will be enough tolerance to uh, bear this ICP. And you have an octogenarian, 80 years old uh, uh, gentleman with traumatic brain injury. These people tend to tend uh, develop hydrocephalus at an ICP level of 5 or 10. So there's no fixed border for ICP, and we need to have something individualized for treatment. Treating everybody at an ICP of 20 is still not the appropriate medicine we can deliver today. And another image coming and showing you why it may not be enough to just to measure ICP is here from Cambridge, UK. This is a patient with traumatic brain injury. You clearly see the contusion here on the right side of the image. And this patient was put in the PET scanner and the patient was hyperventilated, a rather common measure uh, to treat ICP. This was the starting level of a PCO2 of tw uh, 35 with an ICP of 22. And uh, the patient was hyperventilated to 29 with the ICP going down to 17. Seemingly okay, but the images show differently. 
have a look here. This is the oxygen extraction fraction. The number, uh, uh, how much oxygen is extracted from the blood. The problem is not on the side of the contusion, but on the opposite side, the conti uh, contrico side. This whitish uh, tissue here is deprived of oxygen. You cannot bear very much more than an oxygen extraction fraction of 75%. If you continue to hyperventilate this patient, these neurons will die and uh, you eventually will get infarction on the opposite side. And in fact, they rated the number of ischemic brain volume from 44 ml, the upper row, to 135 ml on the lower row. And you see clearly something else besides ICP does matter. So looking at oxygenation and cerebral blood flow, what are the requirements? We want to have some additional measure which is global state of the whole brain, seeing it's quantitative, you want to have numbers, you may want to have it's continuous, so it's ongoing, not only imaging snapshots like a CT scan would provide us, it should be robust for nursing and for treatment, should have a high sensitivity and high specificity, and at least it should have, it would be wishful to have robust thresholds for outcome assignment and to see what's happening with the patient. This ideal monitoring device does not exist. However, there are four techniques coming rather close, and uh, I would uh, like to elucidate two of them, the near-infrared spectroscopy and the brain tissue oximetry. I won't uh, talk that much about jugger bulb oximetry. This is a cumbersome technique which is very nice for research, and I love to play with it, but currently it does not give optimal values in a high busy, high volume environment. The same is true for thermal diffusion blood flow, you can measure with that, and there's accurate measurements if done in a scientific environment. So far, I wouldn't charge it for stable enough for routine everyday use. But going on with near infrared spectroscopy, we learned about the method in this morning, so I can mainly skip this slide. Light is in, uh, put in the, uh, into the tissue and reflected, and you get some nice readings of uh, different parameters, like here. Uh, oxygenated hemoglobin, the tissue oxygenation index, and something else. And this has clearly an association with outcome if it gets for cardiac surgery, for pediatric surgery, for carotid surgery, so basically for extracranial surgery. This is one of the biggest studies on the issue from Herringlake. They studied more than 1,000 patients uh, scheduled for cardiac surgery. The SCO2 uh, was clearly uh, related to the Euroscore, which is a measure of severity. There was the left ventricle ejection fraction, and there was uh, the troponin and the pro-BNP, and there was a clear separation in petting uh, of getting, having survival. So our probability in patients serving no de deoxygenation was much higher, about 93% per compared to patients suffering at least one episode of deoxygenation. This is hard data with 1,100 patients, so there's nothing to argue about. Uh, near infrared spectroscopy does work in this cohort. It gets, however, differently when the brain itself is injured. And this is one of the largest studies from the recent years where they investigated a new device who had nerves and also ultrasound with bilateral sensors just to capture photons with a certain depth, so only to get, uh, not to get extracranial uh, mixture uh, from the extracranial circulation. They did a baseline measurement uh, and compared it to jugular bulb oximetry, did some blood pressure challenge, uh, increasing the blood pressure. They raised the oxygen challenge and they hyperventilated the patient, which should at least decrease uh, serox uh, saturation. If you see it, the results, it was 18 patients after TBI and results are pooled in this table. Mean arterial blood pressure, MAP challenge, it worked as expected. Looking at the monitor, basically it was the same for the challenge. This was a serox saturation, the same and the same in all three tests, same compared to baseline. ICP, however, CPP, however, did react as expected. The same did brain tissue oxygenation, which I'm going to, you to show you in a few seconds. Uh, and also the jugular bulb symmetry, it worked as expected pretty much. What it did not work was the serox saturation. The authors concluded that there was a correlation of the jugular bulb symmetry with the ipsilateral nerve sensor, independent of the pathology in the brain. 
and they concluded further it may be able to provide an estimate of cerebral oxygenation. Wow, this is a statement. I just wondered how on earth could it be possible that erythrocytes do know after entering the brain, being on the right forehead, to which transverse sinus they need to cross uh, after the sagittal sinus, going down in the right jugular bulb oximetry. I really do not know how this worked. I wrote a letter to the editor and uh, to the authors themselves, but never a response. So it's a sad we cannot solve this question. But maybe, to my conclusion, near infrared spectroscopy does not, does not reflect the pathology and the challenges we did with the treatment. So the signal still may be unsure. In the further study, getting further insight into uh, in the near infrared spectroscopy in brain injured patients was done by the group of Nino Stocchetti. They compared 20 healthy volunteers and 20 patients. Again, with the newest device on the market, the same Xerox device as shown before from Orny Medical, and combining NILS with ultrasound. And they showed you in the publication this nice graph with the healthy volunteers being here with the function index of uh, near infrared spectroscopy. And the patients, yes, this BD is suggestive, and indeed it is brain dead patients. So there may be a signal in the individual, but it's different. Uh, there may be a cohort signal, uh, which is statistically different. So the CFI was higher in the brain dead patients, but it's difficult to decide which patient was which. The problem is statistical difference does not account for individual treatment. And to my opinion, this paper clearly shows that current new infrared spectroscopy is questionably new critical care. The editorial about on this paper speculates about the usefulness for autoregulation monitoring. I still have my doubts whether it really works, and it is yet to be shown. So far, near infrared spectroscopy in neurocritical care for brain injured patients, to my understanding, is not working, and it is yet to be shown that there's any usefulness for that. But there's another technology, as shown before, which is the Lycox system or the aromatic PTO probes. Both measure brain tissue oxygenation. These are the two available systems on the market. It's established maybe uh, 25 years ago uh, since then. So uh, Lyco system, the electrochemical system, much, most research on the world is published with that. Was a little bit modified because the temperature probe was then included uh, in the same probe. This compared to the rheumatic probe, which uh, got on the market one decade later, but still, uh, is available and in clinical routine, clinical uh, practice, they show, pair, show comparable values. The advantage of the PTO probe may be that ICP is combined in one probe together with temperature and oxygen, so as a one-shot device. For this system, you need a second device for measuring ICP. The physiologic meaning of uh, brain tissue oxygenation is still speculated on, and this may be one of the most illustrative slides on this. You see brain tissue oxygenation here on the y-axis. You have the cerebral blood flow and this equation times cerebral blood flow times the difference between arterial and venous oxygen tension, not the content. This is different. This is the oxygen tension on the x-axis. In this paper from Guy Rosenthal from San Francisco, they did baseline measurements, the O2 challenge, the MAP challenge, the hyperventilation challenge very similar than it was shown to before with the near infrared spectroscopy. Pooling all the results together show this nice graph indicating the clinical usefulness of brain tissue oxygenation. If you increase cerebral blood flow, brain tissue oxygenation will rise. If you increase the supply of oxygen, the PaO2, uh, maybe by dropping the venti uh, turn the ventilator knob to 100% or so, will increase oxygen tension. Increasing oxygen consumption here, the PVO2 will go down, less content, and so will be the brain tissue oxygenation. And this, this gives you a workable uh, equation on the clinical bedside. And there's a myriad of uh, different uh, co considerations to take into account if you're looking for determinants for brain tissue oxygenation and particular causes for low values. One may be lung function, uh, the CBF problem already was mentioned, diffusion problems with too much brain edema, a hypervolemia will give you low readings, 
and you have uh, raised metabolism due to seizure, temperature raise, or awakening of the patient, also there will be a decline of brain tissue oxygenation values. Normal values are difficult to obtain. This is not from normal patients, but from patients uh, requiring uh, Parkinson's uh, uh, device electrode implantation, where Lycox uh, uh, probe was implanted side by side the Parkinson electrode, and you see a typical thing, r values start low, and after maybe two hours of time, values adapt to a baseline level of about 20 millimeter mercury, and stay this uh, level 20, 23, with a huge variation between individuals. But this gives you some expectation from normal readings of brain tissue oxygenation. And this is the closest we'll get because nobody of us would uh, like uh, volunteer to have a probe implanted. Maybe it works in North Korea, but nowhere else. So I think this is a close approximation. Getting to pro traumatic brain injury victims, it's important to notice and to know where the probe is placed. This is Claudia Robertson's group from Houston then, uh, having here oxygen probes in, uh, implanted in normal brain after traumatic brain injury, unconfused brain, gives the reading of about 25. It goes down a little bit if you're placing this under an evacuated subtural hematoma, goes to 20, 23, 22, 23, increasing over time a little bit, give you still the huge variation seen in the Parkinson's patient. It goes down further, it's placed near a contusion in a uh, damaged forebrain, starting lower, and then stabilizing after a few days. This is hours after admission, translates to 120 hours, meaning five days, stabilizing at 20 something, and it is even lower in the initial phase when uh, probes get implanted in contused brain. So what can you do with this knowledge? Considering these two as normal brain and these two as abnormal brains, gives you some nice summary statistic, which is shown here. The favorable outcome is associated uh, with the probe location in normal or abnormal uh, condition. It's obviously associated with age, which is a very common uh, um, predictor for outcome in traumatic brain injury. But also the oxygen values themselves get into account. Average brain tissue oxygenation was higher in patients having favorable outcome, but still on the normal side for patients having fa unfavorable outcome. What counts are the time patterns of oxygenation, the time of oxygen below 20, below 15, below 10 millimeter mercury, three different thresholds, all get statistical significance. And this was this paper which shaped our understanding that some oxygen values below 20 millimeter mercury should be treated because this is the best association with outcome. The trend pattern is important. If it increases over time, it's better, but it if it stays uh, uh, high, for all the time, you have an association with good outcome as well. What does brain tissue oxygenation mean? And what is the accuracy of this multimodal neuromonitoring to detect hyperperfusion? Well, there's wo work from Pierre Boussard, from Mauro Otto's group, from Lausanne, Switzerland. They did um, uh, investigate brain tissue oxygenation in traumatic brain energy patients and placed the, in the right forehead, regardless of the site of injury, did a perfusion CT scan. The first what they showed is that this perfusion CT scan, global hemispheric uh, CBF compared favorably with the regional CBF measured by the region of interest around the tip of the probe. Next thing was they compared uh, low CBF taken uh, from the perfusion CT scan with normal CBF and the different monitoring modalities. Again, here's oxygen monitoring, brain tissue nation below 20, below 15, below 10, three different thresholds as shown before. They are all statistically significant. There's also values from the uh, microdialysis. So microdialysis helps to distinguish whether the brain is normal or has a low CBF and the regular ICP. The third question they asked was, what does this give us an additional value? And this would be this light gray, the ICP reading alone for detecting hyperperfusion. Perfusion matters as shown before. You have here the additional modalities, microdialysis and oxygenation. So if you see increasing uh, difference between the area under the curve, it's best for oxygenation monitoring, less optimal for microdialysis, but still an advantage. Combining both modalities together 
does not help you. There's no statistical difference between the latter two, last two, oxygen and oxygen and microdialysis combined. Still an improvement numerically, but not better. So if you have only one probe to invest additionally, besides an uh, ICP probe, I would go for brain tissue oxygenation. And adapting treatment to brain tissue oxygenation matters for outcome. This is one of the usual meta-analysis of uh, different studies of, well, okay, there's something written, uh, but you get the image, so the citation is here. Uh, you have a favorite uh, risk reduction, uh, relative risk for mortality, so it's favorite for oxygenation uh, monitoring, and there's also a trend to a better favorable outcome if you use oxygenation monitoring but keep in mind, this is composed of retrospective works, which may or net may not be represent uh, clinical practice and may be biased at somehow at least. The best would be a prospective randomized trial. And fortunately for oxygenation monitoring, this is available now with the BOOST study. Uh, Silvia did show yesterday a few of these slides. I'm uh, reiterating things, but uh, still, this is the prospective trial showing that oxygenation monitoring may be the thing to consider. What did they do? They had uh, 10 centers in North America uh, with both groups receiving both uh, uh, types of probes. One intervention group was treated according to ICP and oxygen with these common goals, ICP below 20, oxygen above 20. It was randomized with a control group therapy only for ICP values. Um, this group also got oxygenation monitoring, but the values were blinded. Primary outcome was the time of compromised oxygen. The study wanted to know whether it's possible to adjust treatment and to adapt and to, to treat actually low oxygen to get to better values. Gives you this uh, four quadrant plot with ICP below and above 20, and also oxygen below and abo above and below 20. Type A intervention is not necessary. Type D is the utmost series of high ICP and low oxygen. And we should address both in our treatment. The treatment schedule was fairly complex, and I won't go into detail for that. Still, you see that neurointensive care is a complex thing that uh, attention matters on the ICU, and if you do that, you can really get a better outcome for your patients. The hypoxia burden in the combined group was less, meaning far to the lower upper, uh, the, to the upper edge on the left side. For ICP, there was no difference, but the study, in fact, managed to have a, uh, to lower the total hypoxia burden. And this translated nicely into outcome, the Glasgow outcome scale at six months. Mortality was less in absolute percentages, not in a statistically significant uh, uh, pattern, but this was not the intent of the study. It was only 110 patients, showing the proof of principle, and this is now investigated with two phase three studies, one being boost free, logically, and another one from Australia being the Bonanza study, also investing oxygen probes. You see also that oxygen monitoring translates favorable to better outcome and does not lead to more dis uh, severely disabled survivors. The r red bars here, in fact, it may be valuable to include this. This was on oxygen, but there's still one topic left, which means to be brain temperature. What about brain temperature? Do you care? Well, there's at least some basic knowledge describes there's a difference between brain temperature and core temperature. This is uh, after, uh, for patients after cardiac arrest and notifying that patients with a mean difference of 0.34 degrees Celsius being brain temperature higher, this is regularly in patients after cardiac arrest. They did not describe a relationship with outcome, rightly so, because it was only a patient and we do not expect to have a significant difference in this patient cohort. But to show you uh, what may be the worth of additional temperature monitoring, have a look at this multimodal monitoring slides. It may be difficult to visualize, but uh, you can have these images later on uh, at the website. You see a patient with intracranial hemorrhage, uh, CPP being rather low, you are already suspecting that this may not be that favorite cause. Autoregulation, as uh, shown yesterday, severely compromised. Oxygen fairly stable, but getting down to the tens. Uh, temperature from a rheumatic probe and temperature from a uh, PICO system being nicely in parallel, about 0.2 degrees above each other. 
Well, pictures change when the patient gets rather high ICP here to above 100, which is not survival. Oxy autoregulation is completely flawed. And here's the turning point, actually, where the patient probably got brain dead. The brain temperature crossing body temperature because metabolism ceases in case of brain death and there's no more metabolism any all because the patient did not survive. This was an apnea testing a few hours later and this was uh, the this last, uh, uh, last thing here is the CT scan confirmatory of CT angiography for brain death. This patient went then or to organ donation. But brain temperature may be indicative of the point where brain death happened, which is usually a time point of the past. You can only decide that this patient is brain death, but you cannot notice when it happened. Well, what can you do clinically with that? This patient is obviously not to be helped with measuring temperature. This is a little bit difficult, to more difficult to explain. And it, the next few slides, which are the last ones, will explain to you why temperature man uh, monitoring is not that uh, in the uh, routine as before, uh, it may uh, be in a few years. This is from a publication from our group uh, where ECOG electrodes, electrocortical uh, uh, strip electrodes were placed in a patient after subroid hemorrhage and oxygenation was monitored. You see clearly that uh, this EEG on the surface of the brain happening at the strip electrode here had some convulsions here, to, uh, going here, going here, a little bit uh, De uh, developing in time and there's a huge oxygenation draft during this uh, spreading depolarization. These spreading depolarizations are linked to final outcome. Uh, the number of SDs uh, are different between patients with DCI delayed cerebral ischemia meaning infarction and uh, final imaging in patients without that. This is research. But now it gets into clinical routine when an Austrian group looks at brain tissue oxygenation, the probability of developing spleen and depolarizations. This is a quartiles of a cohort of SIH patients developing brain, uh, their brain temperatures. If a patient stays below 36.7, which is the lowest quartile, there's a low spreading probability, which increases nicely during the four quartiles. If a patient is febrile in the brain, has a uh, about 23% uh, spread and depolarization probability, which is almost two and a half fold as much, and there's a high significance. If you look at this image, you see that brain tissue uh, temperature uh, even increases shortly before the spreading event, giving you some premature warning uh, time maybe to adapt or to treat this patient. And again, these spreading depolarizations are associated with favorable and out favorable outcome. Having more CSDs uh, per hour gives you an utmost higher chance of having an unfavorable outcome after subroid hemorrhage. However, as told before, it gets fairly complex. Brain tissue uh, Dear temperature. Professor. Dear professor. Okay. The last few slides. This is from clinical imaging, different values showing you that temperature decreases uh, uh, core temperature differently after a different antipyretic medication. Also, did the different behavior. Okay, this is from the PC again, showing you differences uh, in brain and core temperature, and again, linkage to oxygenation and outcome. But temperature measurement, and this is truly the last few slides, is performed difficult. There are several devices on the ICU, and we investigated the utmost uh, recently, uh, the most used of them showing you that the Foley catheter, bloodstream sensor, and temperature sensor, yeah, in a water bath uh, lab test, they measure temperature a certain level, but they do not apply on the same level. You see Foley catheter reads a bit low. The PICO system is pretty very accurate. Romatic is a little bit on the low side, but stable between different monitors. These are two different monitors of the Lycos device, the old one, the new one. And there's even a difference between monitors and with a huge spread, so measurement is not that accurate. Summing up, there's no good data in NIRS after neuro for neuromonitoring in the ICU. Oxygen and ICP are outcome relevant after TBI. Brain temperature is less research, but seems to be important too. Devices are imprecise so far on the market. The goals for ICP is below 20 for oxygen. Well, above 20, body temperature should be below 38, or even brain temperature, it may matter. 
you should consider brain uh, perfusion and heterogeneity of different areas of the brain, whom to monitor severely affected by several patients. Not every patient is salvageable, and not every high ICP and low PTO2 leads to a worse outcome. You need just to try and treat the patient. Outcome effects are difficult to see and most likely lower than anticipated, meaning you need to treat lots of patients and not waste any method based on only five patients' experience. Oh, it does not work. This is not the way it is. You need to have hundreds of patients to see a better outcome. But including these methods will improve your practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Коллеги, один вопрос. Скажите, пожалуйста, применяется ли в клинике и что вы думаете по поводу локальных методик использования снижения температуры ну, в виде шлема? В виде шлема. Could you translate? Uh, do you do you use in your clinical practice uh, Hypertermia. Hypertermia. helmet helmet isolated helmet without uh, any intravenous or uh, corporal device? I fortunately, read these papers with high interest, but I didn't try this themselves. Sorry, no experience in that. No for helmets. I'm sorry for that. Он ответил, что никогда не, не, нету данных, не использовали. Ну, то есть суть терапевтическая в данном случае не рассматривалась. Только, только отражает метаболизм. Okay. Еще вопросы? Да, Андрей Васильевич. Штефан, спасибо большое за доклад. У меня короткий вопрос, он больше к практической. Допустим, в каком проценте случаев у вас используется для обеспечения мультипараметрического мониторинга болт-системы? Потому что я знаю, вы нейрохирург, и вы отвечаете как раз за использование. У какого процента вот пациентов с мониторингом используется болт-система? Андрей Васильевич, по-английски, пожалуйста, у Штефана нет переводчика. Could you please uh, tell me... Uh, uh, it, it, how many rate of patient with multimodal monitoring we routinely use uh, bolt system? Okay, for the bolt system we're using it in almost every patient uh, requiring oxygenation monitoring is usually applied with bolts. I think in my department we're using about 50 to 60 oxygen probes a year, so once per week. And maybe every other patient we're using even a second probe if there's some doubt about the values on one side, just place another probe at the other side. If you're treating SAH patients, so there's a great heterogeneity. Look at your perfusion CT scans, and maybe you want to apply a second probe. Thanks a lot. Thank you.